for you to figure out. Did you push that little button? All right. <laughs> Last words are important, and sometimes they're kind of funny. Back in 1960, James Rogers, he was about to be executed by the Utah firing squad when they said, do you have any last requests? And he said, yes, a bulletproof vest. <laughs> really happened. Major General John Sedgwick was a Union commander during the Civil War. He was killed on the battlefield while he was looking at the enemy. His last words were, they couldn't hit an elephant at this distance. Pancho Villa, a Mexican revolutionary, he was assassinated in his car by a group of gunmen. He couldn't decide what his last words should be. So he said to his friend, don't let it end like this. Tell him I said something. <laughs> well, the last words and the very last words of Jesus are very profound. Check the scripture with me. By this time it was noon and darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. Then Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last. When the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened, he worshiped God. And he said, surely this man was innocent and truly was the son of God. That officer is a Roman centurion. He's in charge of 100 men. This guy had been to hundreds of crucifixions. But this one wasn't like any one he's ever been to before. There's nothing to compare it to. He says this man had to be innocent. This man had to be the Son of God. What did this centurion see that day that he hadn't seen in all of the hundreds of thousands of executions that he had been in charge of? Well, he heard what we've been talking about for seven weeks now, the seven last words of Jesus. He was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus gave forgiveness to his executioners. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And criminals don't normally say that to the people killing them. He heard Jesus give words of assurance to the thief on the cross. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Criminals don't normally talk like that. He heard Jesus entrusting the care of his mother to his uh, best friend. Criminals don't normally do that kind of stuff. He heard Jesus shout his last words, to tell us, die, it's finished. Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. Criminals don't die like that. People don't die like that. And so just maybe the centurion got it right. He was innocent. He was truly the Son of God. I want to say three things before we even jump in here. Number one, Jesus gave his life voluntarily. Nobody took it. Back a few years ago, they had a movie called The Passion. It was pretty graphic, but it was still done well. And after the passion, people kept arguing, who really killed Jesus? Was it the Romans? Was it the Jews? Was it the crowds there? And they all got it wrong because listen to what Jesus said. The Father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrificed it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is what my Father has commanded. And I want to say number two, he also gave his life reverently. Some of you may not know it. We read it for communion. But when Jesus says, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands, he's quoting Psalms 31.5. That's a psalm that mothers would teach their little children to pray at bedtime. 
And remember when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is also quoting from Psalms 22. One. Jesus is quoting scripture on the cross. He is not thinking about his pain or agony. He's worshiping. He is focusing on God. And number three, he gave his life confidently. Jesus shouted these words, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. That's not the way it happens. I've been blessed to be beside a lot of wonderful people who literally were taking their last breath. None of them shouted in their last dying breath. Jesus doesn't die with a whimper. He doesn't die with a groan. He doesn't mumble. He is shouting it out for the people to hear. It is finished. Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. He's not shouting in anger. He's not shouting in despair. He's not shouting in defeat. This is a victory chant. And every single word today has some importance. Each word is going to teach you something about dealing with your darkest hours. Only four of them. So here's number one. When I'm going through a dark hour, I have a father who loves me. Notice the sentence says, Father, I entrust my spirit. When I was in seminary in Tennessee, I was teaching about God as our father at a local church camp. And one teenage girl from the inner city, she said, if God's like my father, I don't want anything to do with him. And I have never forgot that. Because human fathers can be unreliable, they can be inconsistent, they can be selfish, they can be worse, they can be hurtful and evil. But the Bible says God's not like that. He's close, He's consistent, competent, caring, compassionate. And so if the Bible is true, you have a God who loves you very much. And He has the power to help you. <coughs> and He will, if you trust Him. David writes, The Lord is like a father to His children, tender and compassionate to those who fear Him. So no matter what I'm going through, no matter what my darkest days might be, I have a Father in heaven who's perfect, and He loves me. Now the second thing Jesus says by this is that I have a Father who can be trusted. He says, Father, I entrust. You know, God just doesn't love me. I can trust Him. That's kind of the sermon in a nutshell, by the way. God can be trusted. And one of the greatest questions you'll ever face in life is, who are you going to trust? Because how you answer that is going to determine whether you're basically going to be happy or miserable in life, whether you succeed or whether you fail, whether you make something of your life or you just waste it. It all depends on who you trust. Let's consider some options. Who's going to take care of me? How many of you thinking that the government's going to take care of you? Is it working for anybody? <laughs> no, they get kind of a low level of credibility these days. How many of you think that you're going to get uh, your trust from the media or the popular culture? That Howard Stern or Oprah or Dr. Phil is going to guide you in a, along the straight and narrow paths? Yeah, not much chance of that. How about, how many of you are thinking, I will just trust myself? I'll go on my own instincts, and I'll go on my own opinion. I'm going to go through my own emotions. Now, you be careful there, because emotions lie. And emotions can be manipulated. It can be anything from a, a TV show you saw to a bad burrito. Your emotions lie. And guess what? There are people in this world who are really good at manipulating your emotions. I want to suggest that if you're going to trust your life and your future to someone, choose someone who loves you completely, someone who already has your best interest at heart, knows everything about you, is perfect, and will never lie to you. 
Because down here, people are not going to tell you the truth. They're going to spin it. They're going to make it sound nice. And even your closest friends won't tell you completely what you need to hear. But what you really need to hear is the truth. And the Bible says the truth will set you free. It's lies that keep you in bondage because lies you think about yourself or other people or lies the world is telling you right now. To be set free, you have to have the truth. But I give you a warning. The truth will set you free, but most of the time it's going to make you miserable first. We don't like the truth, to be honest with you. I don't want to hear that most of my problems I have in life I brought on myself through poor decisions and dumb moves, but it's true. I don't want to hear that it's my own stubbornness and ego and insecurity that causes most of the stress in my life, but it's true. So who's going to do all that for you? It's a short list of one. God. David again says, for the word of the Lord holds true. We can trust everything he does. You have a Father in heaven that you can trust. That word trust is a special kind of word in the Greek. It means to commit, to yield, but its most common use was to deposit. To deposit something for safekeeping. I mean, you know what a safe deposit box is. When you have something that's really precious or is worth a lot of money, you don't want it stolen, and so you get a safety deposit box at the bank, and you entrust the care of your precious material to the safety and security of the bank. And that's what the word Jesus used. And his full meaning then is, Father, I deposit my life to you. My soul, my spirit, keep them safe. And let me tell you this, whatever you entrust to God, He is going to take care of it. So question obviously is, what do you need to trust to God? And, and I'll give you the answer. It's whatever you're worrying about this morning. Whatever you're worrying about needs to go into God's safety deposit box because you can trust Him. Now, I'm an expert on the subject of worry because I worry all the time. That is probably the one thing that I wrestle with more than everything else except Krispy Kremes. But the truth is, worry is practical atheism. If I spend my life worrying, then I really don't believe all this stuff about God that He loves me and that He exists and is here to take care of me and to tr that I can trust Him. And I'll give you something else that needs to be entrusted to God. Your dark days, your depressing days, your pain, suffering. Listen to what Paul says. This is pretty close to the end of his life. He says, this is why I'm suffering here in prison. But I'm not ashamed of it, for I know the one in whom I trust, and I'm sure that he's able to guard what I've entrusted to him until the day of his return. You really have a perfect father who is more than worthy of your trust. Number three, in these dark times, I have a father who's doing things I can't see. He says, Father, I entrust my spirit. You know, one of the biggest mistakes we make in life and in school and in the scientific community is that since this is matter and this is matter, and my guitar is matter, and my amplifier is matter, that everything in the world is matter. Whatever we see, whatever we touch, whatever we taste, whatever we hear, that's what's real. And if we can't touch it or see it or measure it, it doesn't exist. And that leads us astray. It messes up really serious experiments within the scientific community because there is a spiritual dimension to the physical. You and I are more than just matter. You and I are more than just physical beings. We're spiritual. When you die, your body kind of just fades away. 
but your spirit leads, lives on for eternity. That's all part of being made in the image of God, that we have a soul, we have a spirit, and death's not the end. And one day your heart's going to stop, but you're not. Your spirit keeps going and going. It'll always be somewhere with God or separated from God. Non-smoking or smoking. I mean, that's your choice. All of us have to realize that there is more to life than just physical. And God is working behind life in a very spiritual sense and in a way we can't see. But Paul says it will. He says, for our present troubles are small and won't last long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see now will last forever. When you go into a dark hour, remember you have a father who loves you. He can be trusted, and he is actually working behind the scenes right now for your good. And, and number four, in these dark days, I have a father who can handle anything I give him. It says, I entrust my spirit into your hands. 2,000 years later, we're still using that phrase, Allstate commercial. You're in good hands with Allstate. What do they mean by that? Well, it means you can trust them, I hope. It means they're going to take care of you, I hope. But the final truth you need to know is that when you're going through the darkest hour, God can handle anything you give Him. Your doubts, your complaints, your anger, your pain, your depression, and that phrase into your hands is just awesome because it just describes the beautiful care, security, and ability that comes from a God that really does love you. And God has big hands. He's got the whole world in His hands. Somebody ought to write a song about that or something. You look in the Bible and look at that phrase, the hand of God, it's 200 times plus. You read all 200 verses and you're going to discover that you really want to be in the hands of God because it's a good place to be. Again, Paul writes about this. He says, I think you ought to know, dear brothers, about the hard times we went through in Asia. We were really crushed and overwhelmed and feared we'd never live through it. We felt we were doomed to die and saw how powerless we were to help ourselves. But that was good. For then we put everything into the hands of God, who alone could save us, for He can raise the dead. And He did help us and saved us from a terrible death. Yes, and we expect Him to do it again. So that is statement, Father in I entrust my spirit into your hands. That's not just something you need to say when you draw your last breath. It's something you need to say every day. When you're afraid, when you're worried, you need Father to say, Father, I place my spirit in your hands. When you have a big decision to make, you say, Father, I place my life in your hands. When you're stressed out and you're angry and you're bitter because somebody's hurt you, you say, Father... I place my life in your hands. When you're confused, which you don't know which way to turn, when you're lonely, filled with regret, Father, I entrust my life to your hands. Now, when Jesus said, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands, I've already told you he was quoting Psalms 31. But I want, to see, I want you to see one final verse on how that psalm's end. He says, but I'm trusting you, O Lord, saying you are my God. My future is in your hands. Is your future in God's hands? I hope so. I really do. Stand as we share together our final song this morning. <laughs>